you will notice this last column over here saying pipelined and no, ok. We will look into that later, we will get to that later when we are talking about optimizations. Right now I want to focus on the process itself of synthesis, ok. One further thing you can do is now in the top right hand corner when you are using Vivado HLS, you will see that there is this block called analysis which gives you a more interesting picture of what is going on, right. Essentially what it is saying is I have my top level FFT module, it contains the FFT0 module, right. But if I look at the FFT module itself, this thing on the right, this is sort of like a Gantt chart, right. This is sort of the scheduling chart that we use and in fact this is precisely how the Vivado HLS is going about doing its work. But you will notice that on the top the numbers that you have are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, you know everything seems to be finishing within 12 cycles. So that is the point, these are not clock cycles, these are so called control steps. The idea is that one control step could may correspond to multiple clock cycles, but from the point of view of the top level scheduler, I can just group everything together into one control step, right and say that ok, if one control step takes 20 clock cycles, that is fine. I will still for the purpose of scheduling, all that I care about is I give it a start signal, wait 20 clock cycles, wait for the done signal, ok. During that time I can essentially consider it as one control step where only this function is operating or I can try and put something else that runs in parallel with this function, ok. So effectively what we have is we can think of this as 12 control steps. Now why 12 control steps could not each of these FFT zeros have been combined as one that is different. So, just to be very clear, some of these things understanding exactly what the analysis view is telling you is not easy and I have trouble with it quite a lot of the time, right. Broadly these are the ideas that are being used over here, but exactly why it is giving you a specific number, why so many control steps, why not this other number of control steps, those things change because of the way the compiler has interpreted some parts of your code. So, they may not be entirely consistent each time and understanding exactly what it is and translating that back into what you wrote may not always be 100 percent accurate. So, use it with a pinch of salt, it is very valuable information that it is giving you in terms of what it has identified as the blocks that need to be scheduled and how they are, how the dependencies between them are being handled. But some of the things in terms of how which lines of code got converted into which blocks those things are essentially subject to how the compiler worked on it, right. So, what you can do is you can even go further inside the FFT0 function, you will find that there are a bunch of things that are being done over there. There are a lot of variables that are just called temp, temp1, temp2, temp underscore s, etc. It is hard to really understand what is going on over there except that to a large extent this block out here which tells you the line number and the source file fft.cpp line number 33, right. So, if I go back to fft.cpp and look at line number 33, it tells me that there is an if condition a comparison being done over here, right. So, if I go back to my schedule viewer and look at that particular operation line 33, you can see that this is most likely the computation that corresponds to checking whether something is less than something else, right. So, how do you do a comparison? You basically one way of doing it is you do a minus b and check whether the result is negative, right. Check the MSB of the result. So, some computation and addition equivalent is being done for that. This line number translation essentially tells you that that is what it corresponded to. You can go inside the FFT loop and this also tells you, you know, things like this the i, it is a multiplexer, there is something which is doing the exit condition, a comparison to decide how many times it needs to run, right. But you can already see that what has happened is the number of control steps used inside the FFT label 1 is that itself is something like 6, uh, 5 control steps, right. So, the FFT 0 in other words is using 5 control steps when I go deeper into it. At the top level it showed that it was only using less than that. So, any one FFT module was only taking 2 control steps, ok. So, the idea of a control step, what is defined as a control step is specific to each function that is being synthesized. What this does tell you is the bit reversal 
ha is happening here. The interesting thing is you will notice that it seems to be happening in parallel with the FFT function, right. The reason for that you can sort of understand a little bit later as you go into it. Essentially all that it is saying is as and when the bit reversal is happening the FFT0 function can also start, right and it can start performing its computation. The only thing is only after that FFT bit reversal and FFT0 both of them are completed can the second FFT0 start, then the third one, fourth one and finally the fifth one, okay. So it chains them together one after the other. Let us go back to the synthesis perspective that is where we look at our results over here. So the FFT0 module we saw is taking 81 clock cycles, next thing of interest is the utilization estimates. And if I look at the utilization estimates, it is broadly divided into four classes. First is the BRAMs, how many block RAMs am I using? How many DSP48s, multiplier blocks? How many flip flops? And how many lookup tables? Okay. So, a lookup table can be thought of as the equivalent of a NAND gate or slightly more complex version of a NAND gate, right. So, the number of lookup tables that is being used is roughly the gate count of the design. But the important thing to keep in mind is on FPGAs, two types of hardware that typically consume a large area in an ASIC design, namely the memory blocks and the multipliers are available as custom hardware, right, as predefined blocks. So they do not contribute to your gate count, they do not contribute to your LUT count, okay. So in this case what we find is there is a design that uses four DSP48 slices. Okay. Why does it use 4? You will have to think a bit further about that and try and understand what exactly is going on over there, right. Incidentally, it also does not use any block RAMs at all. So, this particular design at least the way that I have written it does not require any temporary storage. It is able to take the data coming in and rearrange it entirely using the flip flops which it will use as registers. So, it is not that it is not storing anything anywhere, but it is able to do everything it needs just using flip flops. Okay. And finally, this is the resource usage. So, 0 block RAMs, 4 DSP48 slices, 494 flip flops, 799 lookup tables. Like I said, after synthesis and after the actual implementation, the number of flip flops and lookup tables usually comes down by about 10 20 percent easily. Number of DSP48 slices and the number of block RAMs is unlikely to come down unless there has been some massive optimization where it was able to replace a block RAM using some flip flops or something of that sort which is relatively rare. So usually these numbers are more consistent, okay. All right. You can actually go a bit further into that and look at detail. It will actually tell you instance by instance or here there are no sub instances of the FFT0. Where is the DSP48 being used? It tells you exactly where it is being used. It is the expression I0 plus I1 star I2 and I0 minus I1 star I2, you know all of those computations, it tells you exactly where the multiplications are being used. Memory blocks there are not any, but they are, so you will see that the BRAMs are 0, but there are a few flip flops that are used as memory blocks, storage. FIFO is something that we will be using a lot more moving forward, but for now there are no FIFOs in this. Essentially remember the concept of the Khan process networks. In general if you are trying to create modules that are going to communicate with each other, the best way to do it is using FIFOs, right. So in general for more complex designs we will be having a lot of FIFOs in our design, but right now this is a very trivial block without any optimizations, so there are no FIFOs over there, etc. So I am not going to go further into this. Let us take a step back, look at the top level synthesis results, right. So you will see that what I did was this is the top level synthesis result and when I open the group FFT that basically opens up the second level synthesis result, right. So it is a subset of that. So going back to the top level, the utilization estimates at the top level you will see are whatever was used inside the sub module plus something extra. So the number of flip flops used in the sub module was around 400 and something. At the top level it is 850. The number of lookup tables inside the FFT0 module was 799, now it is 1500. Why is that? Because along with the FFT block itself there is also some bit reversal to be done, there is some other 
state logic just to determine when the system starts, how it iterates through the states, how to keep track of which stage is operational, all that other stuff basically adds logic and finally ends up using up somewhere around 1500 lookup tables. The number of block RAMs and number of DSP slices has not changed because whatever I just mentioned the state machines and so on are just so called glue logic, there is no arithmetic computation or major storage of data going on there, right. So, they do not add to those parts. Uh, 